Okay, so welcome to this podcast where I'm going to go through a couple of 1004, 1601 questions for Section A, that's the physical chemistry. And I'm going to look at the questions from 2012, so that was the paper that was taken in January 2012. And here's the paper, so let's have a look. So, Section A, question one. So we're told the Rydberg constant for hydrogen, we're given a value there, and the equation for the wave numbers of the transitions in the hydrogen atom. The first part, A, is to use this value of RH, 109.678, to show the wave number of the photon emitted from N equals 4 to N equals 3 is 5332 reciprocal centimetres. They determine the wavelength in nanometers, frequency in hertz, and the energy in EV of this photon. So let's do that bit first. Always good to tell the examiner where you are. So this is question 1a. And let's write down what we've got. We've got that the wave number is minus the Rydberg constant into 1 over n2 squared minus 1 over n1 squared. And we're told to actually use the value of RH here. And that's 109.678 reciprocal centimetres. So really this is just putting numbers into the equation. And when I stick those numbers into my calculator, I get what I should do, 5332 reciprocal centimetres, making sure, of course, to put in the units. Yeah, Numbers are meaningless without units. So we've done the first bit. So then, to make it clear to the examiner what we're doing next, let's just write down now that we're going to try and find the wavelength. And how do I do that? Well, of course, wavelength is 1 over the wave number, quite straightforwardly, 1 over 5332 which when I put those numbers in my calculator I get 1.875 times 10 to the minus 4 centimetres. That's the correct wavelength in centimetres but we're told to do that in nanometres and so let's convert this. So this of course is 1.875 times 10 to the minus 6 metres, 100 times smaller in metres from centimetres to metres. And remember a nanometer, 1 nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 metres and so let's try and get this in the right form here. So I've got to, if I multiply this bit by a thousand, then I've got to divide this by a thousand. So there, I've got that now in terms of 10 to the minus 9 metres, and so that's 18.75 nanometers. So let's keep going a little bit here. So after the wavelength, we ask for the frequency in hertz. And there's umpteen different ways to do this, but the speed of light, of course, is the wavelength times the frequency. And so rearranging that equation gives me that the frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Now, again, being careful to work in the right units, speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. To get my answer in per second, then I've got to put in my wavelength in SI units in meters. So that's 1.875 times 10 to the minus 6. And then my answer, when I put those numbers in the calculators, I get 1.6 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Yeah, remembering 1 hertz is 1 cycle per second. So my tactic in these equations would always be to do everything in SI units and then convert to the units you asked for at the end. Saves making mistakes, in my opinion. Okay, so we've done the frequency. The last thing it wants us to do is find the energy. It wants us to find the energy in EV, but let's, as I said, do things in SI units first, find the energy of that transition in joules, and then convert to EV. Energy is HC times the wave number. So H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. C is 3 times 10 to the 8. Wave number is 5332, but that's in reciprocal centimetres. Got to go into SI units. So I've got to multiply that by 100 to make sure I'm in reciprocal metres. So everything's going to work correctly. And when I work those numbers out, I get 1.06 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. But I've got to convert to EV. And remember that E in EV is E in joules divided by the elementary charge, the charge on the electron. To turn this energy into EV, it's going to be 1.06 times 10 to the minus 19 divided by the charge on the electron, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. When I put those numbers in my calculator, I get 0.66 EV. Again, being clear to put my units in. And that's about what? 1 EV is about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. We've got about two thirds of that there. So that's part A all done. Nicely laid out. Got my units there, it's clear what we're doing. 
And let's look back at 1b on here. It says, give the values of the n and l quantum numbers of three orbitals that can be populated when an h atom with its electron in a 5p orbital emits a photon. Let's just put a little in reminder that we're going to be emitting a photon from the 5p watt n and l. And of course, really, this is a question talking about how could l change and delta l must change by one unit. We can possibly go down to things in n equals 4, n equals 3, n equals 2, n equals 1. So 5p can in fact go to things in the n equals 4 shell. We can go to 4s and 4d because those are changes in L of one unit. Remember here L equals 1, here L equals 0, here L equals 2. So they're fine. We can also of course go to the 3s and 3d or the 2s or the 1s. So any of those three would have given you a correct answer. Very straightforward. Can't go to the p, and of course you haven't got 2d or 1d orbitals. So that's very straightforward. What about part c? Part c says, explain why the 3d configuration, one electron in a 5d orbital, is split into two states. Give the values of s, l, and j for each of these states. We've got 5d1, and the first asks, for some explanation about why it's split into states. I'm going to write some brief note form here. It would be good to write full text in your answer. The 5D1, let's say configuration, is split into two states by spin orbit coupling. That's perfectly correct, but if you look back at the question here, we've got three marks for this. So just a statement that it's spin orbit coupling probably won't get me all the marks. Let's say something about what spin orbit coupling is. You know, explain why. And so in spin orbit coupling, let's say the intrinsic magnetic moment of the electron interacts with the magnetic moment generated at the nucleus due to the orbiting charged electron. So the motion of the charge of the electron generates a magnetic moment at the nucleus. And that's why, of course, we need it to be orbiting we actually need L to be greater than zero. Now that's very wordy. In fact, it's nice to draw a little diagram of this. So here we have, we've got our electron orbiting the nucleus and we can think of our orbiting electron as a little bar magnet. And the fact that we've got this charge orbiting generates another magnetic moment at the nucleus. And these magnetic moments can be aligned or opposed, giving two states with two different energies. Okay, so a good explanation here. Yeah, I might label this diagram up here to say this is the electron's magnetic moment and this is the magnetic moment generated at the nucleus. And in general, a diagram is a really good way of saving a lot of words. Nice big diagram that's easy to read. Okay, so there's our explanation as to why the spin orbit coupling gives us two states. Yeah, that's a really quite an extensive explanation I've given there. Yours could be perhaps even a little briefer. Give the values of L, S and J for each of these states. 5D1, so we've got spin, one electron, spin's always a half. L, we're in a D orbital, so two. So remember, J goes from L plus S down in steps of one to the magnitude of L minus S. So in this case, that's two and a half, five over two, down in steps of one to two minus a half, that's three over two. And there's no steps of one in between there. And so we've only got values of j being five halves or three halves. Our one state has s equals a half, l equals two, j equals five halves. And our other state has s equals a half, l equals two, j equals three halves. What we've got now is a work out the term symbols for the five states that arise when you've got an electron in the n equals three shell of the H atom. Of course... We've got the 3s, the electron in the 3s. So here we have s equals a half, l equals naught. And so j, l plus s is equal to l minus s when we remember we're only taking the absolute value. And so j is a half here. So l plus s is a half, l minus s is minus a half, but we take the positive value. And so the only value of j is a half. And so our term symbol then is double s one half. We, of course, have a 3p orbital, and so that's s equals a half, l equals 1, j equals l plus s, 3 halves down in steps of 1 to l minus s, that's a half, 1 minus a half, so we've got a doublet p, 3 halves, doublet p, 1 halves, states there, and of course the 3d, s equals a half, 
L equals 1, J equals, just done this, L plus S, 5 halves, 3 halves, so doublet D, 5 halves, doublet D, 3 halves. So that's that bit done. The final part then says show that when you look at the spin orbit structure going from 5d1, which we thought about in part c up here, down into the n equals 3 shell, we're going to get three lines in the emission spectrum. So we've got to draw a nice energy level diagram here and apply the selection rules and see that we get three lines. So we're starting up in the 5d level here, and we already worked out, remember, in that case, we have a doublet D three halves and a doublet D five halves state. Remember the lower value of J lies lowest in energy. And then down here we're drawing energy here. And remember there's a big break in energy. We can go down to the N equals three shell. And so there we have our doublet S one half from the S orbital. We have doublet P one halves, doublet P three halves, and I've got a doublet D five halves, doublet D three halves. Now really this question is saying can you then apply the selection rules and remember delta S is zero and for a hydrogen atom because we've always got one electron that really isn't a restriction. Delta L is plus or minus one and delta J can be naught or plus or minus one. And so we're starting up here. So as I said delta S equals naught really provides no restriction. These are all doublet states but here We've got L equals 2, we're in a D state, so we can't go to another D state. We can't go to these D states over here. These ones over here, we're not going to go there at all. L equals 2 to L equals 2, we can't do that because we're breaking that selection rule. Similarly for D to S, here L equals 0, here L equals 2, so we can't do those transitions. So we're only left with the D to P. D to P, L equals 1 to L equals 2, that's fine. So now we've just got to worry about the changes in J. So let's draw these in. J equals 3 halves here. can go to J equals 3 halves there. That's a change in J of 0. 3 halves to 1 half, change of 1. That's OK. 5 halves to 3 halves, that's OK. 3 halves to 1 half. One half, that's okay, but five halves to one half, that's a change of two, so that's not allowed. So we see here, quite clearly, three lines, which is what the question asked us, nice and clear. So again, nicely laid out, nice clear diagram. We could label the transitions here, so we've got doublet D five halves to doublet P three halves, doublet D three halves to doublet P three halves, and doublet D three halves to doublet P one half. So that's all there is to it.